Okay, how's the audio here? Good, at the bottom, can you hear me well? Right, so we're gonna start now. Um, thanks for coming. Uh, just to get an idea of who's, uh, what, uh, who's in the audience, uh, can you raise your hand if you're a developer? Right, Mo mostly, right. Um, sysadmin, right, DevOps, pretty much the same. Right? Some people say they're DevOps and not sysadmin. Um, uh, who's none of those? And would like to say what's his or her role? Right, pretty much that's it. Okay, great. So, little introduction. Uh, my name is Juan Pablo, but I like to be called Juanpi. That's how everyone calls me. That's also my nickname in most of the uh, social networks. Sometimes I take 72 whenever Quampi is taken. Um, I've been working with Drupal projects for around almost five years. And I maintain some modules in core and in country. I wrote a book on Drush. Um, I, it was almost three years ago. I'm writing a new book now um, with, for packet publishing. And it should be ready, I guess, by the end of the year. And since a year and a half ago, I started using AngularJS in, in Drupal projects. And well, I love it. Like the more I use it, the more, <laughs> the more I like it. Um, and well, uh, I, uh, my, employ my employer is uh, a lot about, I worked there as a developer, mostly uh, backend developer and a little bit of JavaScript as well. So here are two tools that we're gonna mention a lot during this talk. Uh, since I already asked what kind of audience we, we have here, um, I guess pretty much everyone has, has used GitHub. Um, we're going to talk about how to integrate systems with pull requests so we can spin up testing environments with it. And Jenkins, if you never used it, it's a continuous integration system that doesn't mean anything to me. Um, but uh, if we would wanted to define it, we could say that it's something to automate tasks. Like you do something every day a few times, either in your local or in a server. Well, Jenkins can run it for you, either on demand or periodically. Um, so we're going to start with a practical example. Let's imagine this workflow where we have a ticketing system, Jira for example, or, or even GitHub if you like. For each ticket, whenever we start working on a ticket, we create a branch, and then we push that branch and create a pull request on GitHub. And uh, we will have a testing environment for each of these pull requests where we can actually test our, our branch in action and we can share it with other folks from the team or with the client. And once this gets merged, it goes to the development environment, it's kind of a main vision of what's currently in master branch. And um, then there is a late, uh, a later process to deploy a tag, like a release into staging first and then into production. So given this, this scenario, if I start working on a ticket and I create a pull request uh, once I'm happy with, with the work I've done for this particular ticket, um, I go to GitHub and assuming that obviously that we have our code in GitHub. And um, I created this pull request um, with the ticket number and, well, there's a little description there. And after a few minutes, I created this pull request. Um, there is a user in GitHub who is called, called Tagbot uh, who has posted automatically this, uh, this information. Um, first is a URL containing the pull request ID that contains uh, this branch. And you can navigate to that. And the second one is instructions on how to tear it down. Either you want it to be rebuilt or you're simply done with your, with your peer reviewing. Um, this, this is just a, a Jenkins, a Jenkins uh, job that destroys a Drupal installation. While this is the result of another Jenkins job that clones, a, let's say, a, a master Drupal site. So, in, in this particular project uh, we, I was working, we were using um, the IRC plugin for Jenkins. It adds a bot into a channel, and you can trigger commands uh, to build a, a job or uh, with, and provide parameters to it. There are many other ways. There have been other projects where we would just post a link that you click on it, you click on it and it tears out the environment. At the end, it's just a, it's just a way of deciding how you want the, the job in Jenkins to be triggered. 
So then it starts the process that we call the peer review process, which is just a discussion. You and other folk are checking code, looking at the code and making sure that it works, testing it on the testing environment and maybe getting screenshots of it and then you get to a point where the peer reviewer says, okay, this, this, this pull request is ready, it meets the requirements of the ticket, so um, I'm gonna merge it. So the pull request gets merged and, and this person level, he runs the, he goes to IRC and says, JDL, this pull request ID and the tagpod user, uh, which is actually a user that is managed by Jenkins, uh, just mentions that, hey, it's been destroyed, that's fine. Uh, that will delete all the file structure, drop the database for this testing environment, and that's it. So how does it help? Well, it, it helps everyone in the team to make the development process way more flexible. Everyone can work in, a, in an isolated environment for each ticket, and you can group as a bunch of tickets um, in a testing environment. So let's say if you're working towards a project that will last uh, three weeks, you can create all your pull requests on top of a branch and have a testing environment for that, that, that branch. And that you can have the client to be in, uh, like closer with you having a look at that t testing environment before you merge that onto master. So I'm gonna go over some of the different stakeholders on a project and how this, this workflow with the pull request builder uh, helps them. So first of all, clients and the QA team, they got a URL that they can test with, uh, what you're working on. Um, this screenshot is from the MSNBC project where we are using it. And um, they, want, they run a, a live event where they were, there was a panel, people were debating some topics, and, and you could vote. Um, as, and, and they would read the stats live and, and, and uh, discuss on top of them. So they wanted this to be ready in, I think it was just, uh, this tool to be in two or three weeks. And obviously, since it was such a short uh, time for that, we needed to be like pretty much every day just be being very close with us, working with it. But at the same time, we also had to keep on doing normal releases to the project. So there were, we, we couldn't do everything in development. So that's why we created a base branch for this out of master. This was the main testing environment, and we created, we had all, obviously a, a bunch of tickets to accomplish this, this project. And uh, we would create sub-branches and mini testing environments, I finally, sorry, getting them into this testing environment. And every two days we'll ask the client, hey, this is the current progress, how is it going? So um, it gave a lot of, um, trust to the client and the QA team that they could see things and not having to wait for us to prepare a release and deploy it to staging, for example, and maybe had to roll back. So another, another uh, stakeholder that benefits is, and we, we realize it really helpful for the development team, are external teams. Whenever we had to integrate a JavaScript API from a third party team, um, we encountered this scenario where um, for example, in this, this is a listing from the MSNBC project, and we, 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 we integrated the, all the social stuff was coming from Newsvine, which is MSNBC social network. So they provided a list of widgets and API calls so we could bring up all the social media stuff in the website. And in this view, this is a view powered by, um, it's an Ajax, it has Ajax paging, and we realized that when we were implementing the social counters, it was just a widget that their API would parse and, and render the counter. So on first page load of an article, this was working fine. But then when you would click on next, this, the, the next set of articles would load, but uh, not the counters. So since we had a testing environment for this, we could just send an email to the, the team and say like, hey, this is something missing. How should we do it? And they helped us, so we fixed it. We rebuilt the testing environment. We confirm it with them, and that's when we consider the ticket to be done, and that's when we merge it on the main branch. If we wouldn't have had this, we would have to, for example, merge our branch on top of master, let it go to development, ask them, and then fix. The problem of that, that, uh, that workflow is that you are polluting master with work that is not ready, and imagine if you merge something, goes to development, well, goes to master branch, and someone else has to push something to production so, you know, 
uh, that's a hotfix plus your code that is broken and it may, this is JavaScript code so it's not as damaging, but if it's PHP code and if it has a bug, then well, you just got a bug into production. So this way we keep it isolated. Um, and for the peer review process, uh, well, uh, it helps with what I like to call the upgrade path. You know, every time you download a database from development or production into your local, or every time you deploy code, you need to go through this set of steps, uh, re register a build, uh, run database updates, revert all features, and make sure that everything works. Um, this process uh, has to be reviewed whenever, exa uh, for example, you add database updates, or you manage fields and export them in features. Sometimes you need to have, to have to, um, extra code for that, or sometimes database updates need to run in a particular order. And, and the, good, the good thing about this process is that uh, the Jenkins job will check out the branch with a, using a fresh copy of uh, production or development, dep depending on how often you download a, a database, and, and run the steps. And if, it, and if the steps fail, um, Jenkins will realize that some of the steps fail, and it will post uh, a gist, or you can, if you get access to Access Jenkins, you can just see it there, and post it on the pull request. So saying like, hey, you know, there is something wrong in, in, the, in the set of uh, steps to upgrade the database, so have a look. So this is really good for both developers and peer reviewers in a way that they can prepare a database upgrade and test it without even having to download in the database every, every time they, have to, they want to test it. Um, Whenever the database starts going bigger than two, two gigabytes or three gigabytes, um, this saves a lot of time. Also for, for peer reviewers, um, you don't have to have a local. Like sometimes I've been with a, with a different laptop and doing peer reviews because if I want to test uh, someone else's ticket in my local, I have to check out the branch, do the whole upgrade process, make sure that I have a working environment maybe I have to also touch a node and put some certain conditions that meet the ticket requirements. Um, I don't have to do that if, if, if I have independent testing environments. I, actually, the developer can just prepare the environment for me and say, hey, just open this node. I prepared it for you. You can, you can see you know, the, the work I've done in, and you don't have to actually set it up in your local. So again, it's a, it's a time saver for, the, for both of them. Um, this is a very simple architecture of how this works. Let's say on, on the top right corner we can see the production environment. Um, you can set this up with Drush or with Cron or with Jenkins just once a day, depending on how important it is for you to have fresh databases on your testing environments. We normally do it once a day. You download files and, and the database onto the testing environment. This testing environment uses uh, uh, a wildcard for testing uh, for creating websites for each testing environment. 72 would be a pull request ID from GitHub, same as 543. I don't know how this set up in, in Nginx, but in Apache web server, it's called a dynamic virtual host. You basically set a star here, and that number then maps with a physical path, like this would mean uh, bar dub 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 uh, 72.prmysite.com, for example. That's how you can uh, manage manage this. Uh, Jenkins on the on the bottom left is kind of orchestrating, like it's watching your GitHub repository for new pull requests or updated pull requests. It's a, it's, a, it's actually a plugin that does it automatically. Whenever there is a change in your repository, it will do whatever you want. In this case, it will call the build job. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So basically it's, uh, Jenkins just sets, uh, listens to these webhooks in a way that if there is a change, it will run whatever you have in your job in Jenkins. So either, um, yeah, there is a new pull request or either there is a new commit in the pull request. So when that happens, it will trigger the job that basically rebuilds the testing environment. So um, the actual build job uh, in, in detail would be check out the particular branch or, well, pull request in, from GitHub. Um, there is in the testing environment uh, what we call a master site, which is the template that downloads the production or development database. So it will clone it, like just adding a suffix. Let's say if the database is my site, it will clone it to my site underscore that, that pull request uh, ID. Um, oops, sorry. 
uh, in the new file structure, it would uh, adjust settings, just append the database array, maybe overwrite some settings that you may need. It depends. It, we realize that every project is different, so we, we have to make normally a lot of uh, adjustments on this, on this system, so it really um, represents uh, a production environment. Uh, run all the steps to upgrade the database, and finally post a comment on GitHub. Oops. And as for the teardown, whenever you, you trigger it, it just drops the database, deletes the, all the project files, and posts a comment. It's very simple. Okay, so over, the, over time, we, we started using this, this system on the, on the Tyson project um, because they needed this kind of functionality. And then we started using it at our, our corporate website at lolabot.com. Um, over then from that we went over to Martha Stewart and we use it there as well and then it was an SMBC. During all of these projects, obviously the code base evolved and we in some cases we added we added extra jobs for to test extra stuff. Like for example, um, in the MSNBC project uh, some people would forget to uh, tear down environments after a pull request was done. Sometimes we, we didn't want this to be automatic, like you merge the branch and automatically that triggers the job to destroy the testing environment because sometimes you merge it and maybe the client wants to still play a little bit with that testing environment. So we created a job that checks like, hey, is this pull request uh, closed? Uh, is there a testing environment? Yes, if it's older than a week, okay, then trigger the job and, and tear it down. Um, also, we have Casper.js tests on the MSNBC project, so after you get the message saying this is a testing environment and here is how you can tear it down, there is another message being posted saying like, uh, happy face, hey, all test pass, or the guy of Doom dying saying, I'm sorry, you know, test fail, and you get the full log of all the assertions. Um, in, uh, in the lullabot.com uh, website, uh, we're using Resemble.js to make sure that uh, we don't have visual regressions. We realized, for example, that we deploy a new release and there was like a 20 pixels padding like in, at the header and it's really hard to spot that whenever you are uh, quickly reviewing a release before deploying it. So um, there is a job there that takes a few screenshots and shows you like visual changes on it. So it's really helpful to make sure that you don't introduce any, any visual regressions. Um, kind of uh, what Rust does, Jay, uh, Drush uh, ULI, well, you, you, uh, it's a job that posts a login link. Sometimes a client doesn't want to open a testing environment and enter credentials, so you just post a link there, they click, and they are logged in as the administrator in the testing environment. And, and the create spare database, it was for um, the MSNBC project because the database was so big that creating a testing environment was like a half an hour process, something like that. And um, we optimize this project by like kind of in advance doing a, 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 a database clone with a suffix. So if you, if you trigger a testing environment, it would use that, te that spare te uh, database and obviously it will be just two minutes. If during the next 30 minutes someone else would trigger a testing environment, it will have to wait until the next spare te database is ready. But anyway, for the amount of people we were in the team, it was good enough. Um, what's next? Uh, I am maintaining the, the system I'm explaining now. Uh, it's an open source project. It's, uh, um, I think it's on the session description and at the end of the slides. But some of the folks at Lullabot are working on, a, on a, an actual product on top of this and they are rewriting it. It's not open source yet, but it will. It's called uh, Tagboat. There is a URL here and there is a newsletter that you can sign up if you want to get news on it. And here is like a ballpark of what it's been going on there so far. It's using Node.js instead of uh, a mix of bash scripts and Drush, which is what the current system uses. Um, it doesn't really need to use GitHub. Like there are some, some folks that, for example, don't use GitHub, but they use Unfuddle in their projects, for example, and well, the system will post comments on Unfuddle instead of GitHub. It's just, it would be just a different plugin, let's say. Um, it uses Vagrant to spin a new environment, which is great. I haven't looked into that piece of code yet, but uh, um, it obviously makes things way simpler and faster because obviously the team can also use those Vagrant environments and uh, everything is more standardized whenever you are testing stuff. 
And uh, yeah, as I said, for the moment it's closed source, but the idea is to open it. I cannot say when, but as soon as possible, obviously. So uh, what to do now? That's the, that's the open project. Uh, that you can have a look at and, and test it. I am I am man the one maintaining this. Um, the problem with this repository is that it assumes that you are going to use Jenkins straight away. So the scripts ex expect some Jenkins variables to be to be available. So if you want to set up your local with it, you will have to install Jenkins, uh, prepare a sample Drupal project, and set it up. Um, in the last days, I've been just simplifying this, so it just uses Drush and just does the build job. That's it. Integrating with GitHub would be something external, like an extra plugin, but I haven't released a piece of code yet. And as for the other one, as I said, just subscribe to this newsletter uh, if you want to be up to date in news. Um, announcement for Friday. If you've never been uh, to Sprint, I really encourage you to do It's a lot of fun, and you can be next with really great developers and learn. That's going to happen on Friday. Um, oops. Uh, another announcement, Drupal Camp Spain. That's going to be next, uh, next year in May. We had a really nice Drupal Camp last year. I think we were like around almost 300 people. There was a full track in English. There were uh, quite a few uh, non-speaking, non-Spanish speaking folks who came. So we are really looking forward to, to, bring it, uh, to bring more people from outside Spain and make it kind of a more, little bit more international event. And it's happening in, in Jerez in May, right? Yep. So um, we're going to go on for questions now. If you have a question, please go to the mic there. So it, uh, it's recorded. Can you create test content? Sorry? Can you create test content or test environment? By hand, you mean? Right, so the question is, do you create new content to, for a particular testing environment? I would say, if you create a new feature, do you mean a new feature as working feature for the client, right? Yeah, um, we, we didn't have the scenario where we had to create a huge amount of content. Um, normally, uh, we would just use the master data, I mean the production database, and if we had to add some nodes, we would just add them ourselves. Like we needed, we never had to have a bunch of content created for a particular testing environment. If we had to, we would just use maybe devil generate and run the command there. At the end, it's a server that is under our control, so any anybody from the team can just jump into the server and run any commands they like. So it's at the end, it's code that you ma you, ma you maintain. So. Is it, if it's, is it as if, as if it was your local environment? Right? Any more questions? Yep? What do you think about um, file assets? You are seeing quite a new higher asset size, uh, production size, I assume? Yeah. Um, we started, we download from production onto the testing server the files, and we use a stage file proxy module. Um, that saves us from having to copy all of the files onto other testing environments. Um, for anybody who has never used this, this module, the state file proxy, um, what it does is like you define kind of a master server where Drupal is going to try to look for um, image styles. So whenever you open a testing environment and it has an image from the, within the files directory, it will see if it's available in the local server. And if it's not, it will just use the master server that you say. So that saves you from having to copy the images all over. So that's how we do it. There are also some modules that may come handy to, to install at the end of the build process. For example, um, if you just don't want any sort of email to be sent, you would install maybe reroute, email reroute. If emails are important for you, you may want to lock them into a file and inspect them later. It depends on your scenario. Um, Obviously, sometimes in the testing environments, we also enable UI admin modules like views UI, field UI, so you can have them available. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Any more questions? Yeah? Mm-hmm. 
-hmm. Yeah. Right, so the question is, how do we test the editorial uh, workflow changes? And um, what we do, um, especially in MSNBC, where that is, everything is content, we have a batch of uh, Casper.js tests. We're using a country module called Casper.js um, that uh, it has a bit of integration with Drupal, so you can manage sessions. You can do stuff like, okay, so as an editor, I want to do this, and then as an anonymous user, I want to verify that this happens. So that's the example I, I mentioned before, that first the environment is built, and you get the link to the environment, and then another message is posted once this extra job uh, has, perf has finished performing a uh, Casper.js test, and it will tell you, like, hey, this works, this works or not. And we have, um, like, we, we discuss with the editorial team, like, what's your workflow normally? And we just wrote tests for that. So they will, it will tell us if we broke something on the editorial environment because in the, in the editorial process because obviously for this project it was very important to keep it uh, stable. It's another job that runs, uh, the Casper.js module has a, it's a rush command and it says, well, run all the tests that are located in this folder of the project against that testing environment and it will just browse the environment and, and yeah, perform all the assertions. Any more questions? Right? This slide, oh, do you mean this one? Yeah, this is a sprint. Like, this is like everybody in Drupal can ask. ask. I there was a special sprint. Oh, to this. No, I'm going to, I think I'm going to be around, and I'm going to be working on that Drush version I mentioned. Actually, uh, if anybody wants to show up, uh, to me to show them, I'll, I'll just show it. It's like, it's a command that clones, and then there is this build parallel house where you can see it. So, um, yeah, just. Look for me. I think I'll be. I think I'm gonna be during the morning in the sprint. Any more questions? No, so far the biggest we we experience the big the bigger pro the biggest projects where we used it was is the MSNBC project. We realized that um, we had to scale up the server whenever we were 15, 18 developers, and all of most of them creating testing environments. Actually, um, what we did before, what we did uh, first thing to improve that was that well, maybe not every pull request needs a testing environment. Sometimes it was just a CSS change, for example, or a typo in a, in a, in a statement, in a PHP statement. So we made, it, um, we made it manual. Same as we were doing on IRC JDEL to delete a testing environment, we will have JTest to spin up a testing environment. So that obviously reduced the amount of testing environments we had. Um, but we didn't have many issues. Like, yeah, I mean, it's, it's just a matter of waiting because we just set, to, set the Jenkins to just run this, this build process once. So if um, five people trigger a testing environment, it will just queue up and you will wait. At the end, it's testing. So normally, you as a developer will just, you, you are done with your work when you're building the testing environment. So you would just trigger a testing environment, move on to something else. Once the testing environment is ready, you will get a notification through GitHub. And if you need to perform any actions for the peer reviewer to have a look, then you will do it. So it's asynchronous. Yep. Right, so the question is how you keep the master database fresh with production data. Um, we run Drush SQL sync and Drush rsync files from production onto the testing environment once a day. It's a, it's a two lines job in Jenkins, yeah. Well, obviously what we also take, in, take, take care in there is to sanitize. Like we run normal sanitization for user usernames and passwords. We also raise some data that is not needed because we don't have to have such a big database. So there is a, there is a little process there that does some cleanup of the database so it's more usable.
Yeah. Do you think it would be, well, but the thing is that we would be stressed in production because we would be asking MySQL to create a database dump every. Oh, you mean asking it to the slave to do it instead of, that would be definitely be faster. But so far, so far we were, we, we have been fine doing it this way. I mean, as I said, the, the major issues we had with uh, uh, performance was uh, what, that a lot of people were creating a lot of testing environments and with that two gigabytes database that scales up pretty, I mean, you, you're in trouble very quickly. But apart from that, I mean, nobody, everybody was is fine about just leaving the, the build job running and moving on to something else, it's fine. Anything else? Okay, thank you very much.